Okay, I told you guys I was going to start this Bible Institute. Just a place where I can teach you everything I know about the Bible, which I've been doing anyway. But now, make it more organized, and we're going to start on the outside, work our way in. The Bible's a puzzle, and just like you would a puzzle, you start on the outside, work your way in. There's some things that you need to put together first before you get in and just learn little random topics here and there. And this will really help you with the Bible, starting on the outside, working your way in. And we're just going to start at the very start, although there is no real start because the Bible is never ending, but with God, he never had a beginning. So with our finite minds, we really can't uh, imagine it or figure it out, but we're just going to do the best we know how. So we're going to start from everlasting. And I want to say before I get into this that this is really controversial what I'm going to talk about today. And it's not something that I think uh, that you have to believe to be a Bible believer. There are going to be a lot of people who don't believe what I'm saying and they're still Bible believers. They're not evolutionists. They're not uh, bad people or nothing. They're not less of a Bible student because they're going to disagree with some things I'm going to say. Because when you get into this topic on both ends, you've got people who are throwing out the name heretic and saying heresy and being really mean and smart alecky, but we're not like that. Most likely you're not like that if you listen to me because, you know, I'm not like that. I, I just let people be who they are. And if something, and if they don't agree with something or they disagree with something, um, it's not that big of a deal, you know, because this isn't a, salvation doctrine here this is you know something that's <clears throat> it's not like you're denying the blood of jesus or the deity of christ or the virgin birth or the resurrection if you don't agree with it it's nothing like that so i just wanted to say that before we get into it but i'd be really doing you a disservice if i didn't explain this teaching to you and i haven't really ever did this topic and broke it down so here it is but I'm going to start with from everlasting. And this is going to be like a Bible scene selection. You know, you got like a DVD. You put the DVD in. It's got a scene selection on there. Well, that's the way God is with his creation and with time. He can put the DVD in of this entire existence of the world. He can press play. He can fast forward. He can rewind. He can pause it, and you see him do that in the Bible, actually. You see him carry John forward in time. You see him make the sun stand still. If he wants to go back, he could go back. And God is so present that he's present in Genesis when you're reading Genesis. He's present in Exodus when you're reading Exodus. And then you go to Revelation, see stuff that hasn't even happened yet, and he's there too. So God's outside of time. He's not limited to it. And we're going to, the first scene we're going to look at is <clears throat> from everlasting. In Psalm 41, 13, it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting and to everlasting. Amen and amen. So God is outside of time. And he will not only be here in the future forever, he was also forever in the past too. There was a time outside of time that God was in eternity with himself where was he? I don't know. I guess just in his glory. And this is a great lesson. Why is this a great lesson? Because God is the only thing that satisfies. So when God was all there was, he was completely satisfied in himself. So if God is all you have, then that should be enough to satisfy you. You don't need anything else. If you don't have a house, if you don't have a car, if you don't have a friend, a, a husband or wife... But you have God, that's all you need. Because there was a time when all God had was God. It says in Isaiah 57, 15, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. Inhabiteth eternity. He's from everlasting. There was never a time when he wasn't here. And you can't understand that, but that don't mean it's not true. 
you think about it, there had to be a time when there was no time and man wasn't here, but there had to be somebody here for us to eventually be here. We couldn't have came from nothing. Something couldn't have just started because what would it have started from? There had to be somebody and obviously it would be stupid to think it was a rock or something that was always here that we eventually came from. It was God. It was a almighty intelligent being that we came from. He's a holy God, a God that cannot sin, he cannot lie. And it's a comforting thought to me that the God who has been God forever has been holy, just, merciful, and a gracious God forever. You know how they say old timers are set in their ways? Well, God is the original old timer. He's the old timer of all old timers. He is the ancient of days, as Daniel 7, 9 would call him. And I thank God that he is set in his ways. Because he's always been holy, just, merciful, and a gracious God. And he's just not going to wake up one day and say, I'm mean now. I'm going to kill you. I'm, I thank God for that. In Malachi 3.6, it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. So the Bible takes for granted that God is real, and it doesn't give any credit to any atheist. It says in Psalm 14.1, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. It's a foolish thing to pretend that there is no God. And walking on this earth in the flesh and reading a book about an invisible God can cause you to forget that there is more than just this world that you're living in. You'll start living like a practical atheist. So constantly acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ in everything. Psalm 90 and verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. I'm also thankful that the God who was here from everlasting is the same one who will be God to everlasting. I don't want a new boss. I don't want to get used to a new schedule. I have a chart laid out of the end times, the rapture, the tribulation, the millennium, the ages of ages, and eternity. And I don't want to have to scrap that and, and make a new schedule. You see, God's plan is going to come to pass because he's not going to retire. He's not going to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I've, I'm, I'm the ancient of days. I'm too old for this. I'm going to make Michael the archangel, the new God, and he may change some things. No, he's... He is our God from everlasting to everlasting. The Lord Jesus Christ testified to the fact that God has always been here. And in John 17, 5, he says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. In John 17, 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Another fun fact is that God knew about you before the world began. In 2 Timothy 1, 9, it says, Who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Way back in eternity, you were a thought in God's mind. Sometimes you sit around and think nobody ever thinks about me. You're wrong again because God had you on his mind way back in eternity past. That should also make you feel bad at the same time because how much thought are you giving God in the present time? The present time is a present from God. Are you thankful for this gift he's giving you in this present time? If God was thinking about you in eternity past... Shouldn't you be, do more thinking about him in the present? It says in Colossians 1, 14 through 18, and if you don't have these verses memorized, you really need to memorize them. It says in Colossians 1, 14 through 18, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. 
and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. If, if God is before all things, then that shows you that he was here before Genesis 1-1. And the author of the book was obviously here before the book. If you want to know the book, then you need to get to know the author. So why are you here? Why are you on this world? A lot of people ask that question. Well, the Bible tells you exactly why you're here. In Revelation 4.11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. That is the meaning of life. That is why you're here. That is your purpose. Everything is supposed to be for God's pleasure. You know, some Bible hater may say, Well, that's selfish. We're here just for his pleasure? No, it's not selfish. <clears throat> Think about it. You make things all the time for your pleasure. You know, if you're like me, you can't make anything. All I can make is a sandwich, but I'm making it for my pleasure. Is that selfish? No. I got to eat something. Sure, I make sandwiches for m my children, but the Lord also makes all kinds of stuff for the pleasure of his creatures as well. You know, there's nothing wrong with God making something for his pleasure. And, you know, like the Bible says, shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? You know, you can't come, you shouldn't come to God and say, why did you make me this way? I mean, the thing is, though, you can approach God that way and ask him those questions. But really, when it comes right down to it, I have no right to be mad at God for how he made me. I'm the creation. He's the creator. But before he made anything, he was alone inhabiting eternity. And the Godhead has always been here. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. All three are God. It's one God, three persons, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. That's a controversial subject as well. Jesus Christ didn't just begin in a manger one day. He is God manifested in the flesh. And at that time, he came down in the likeness of sinful men. He came down in the likeness of sinful flesh, a completely unselfish act where he left heaven to come down and die for sinful men. And way back before that, Jesus Christ himself, the living word, brought everything into existence. He was here before the creation. He's not a created being. So that is... Scene one, just like a DVD player, you put it in, God can lay it out that way. God can look back and see from everlasting. He's in eternity. And then the next one is in the beginning. That's the next scene, is in the beginning. And here's some details about this in the beginning. The account of in the beginning is Genesis 1, 1 through 1, 2. Uh, that's what I want to show you and talk about is Genesis 1, 1 through 1, 2, just the first two verses of the Bible. And this is where it's going to get really controversial. A lot of people get really, really upset about this. I don't. I let people be who they are. I'm laid back. I like to take it easy. I don't want to argue with you. I don't like to get mean with people. I like to be friends. So I'm still your friend if you don't believe me on this. And I hope you're still my friend if you if if we don't agree. So the account we're looking at, Genesis 1, 1 through 1, 2, the length of time, really unknown. But I tend to think 2,000 years, and I'll explain that right now or later. But I, I think this length of time that was in between these two verses is probably 2,000 years. Not billions of years like anti-gap people want you to believe that we believe. They want to make you think that we're putting billions and billions of years in between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. But the most Bible believers are not doing that. Who's the main character of this scene? Lucifer and the sons of God. So what's the agreement? You see, God always has an agreement or a covenant going on with his creation. The agreement here is worship God as the Most High. What's the test? Well, God made beings that had mighty power. Lucifer had wisdom and beauty. 
The test is not to let all that go to your head. Are they going to let that go to their head or are they going to still see God as the most high way above them? What's the token of this agreement or covenant? Well, it's got to be God's throne. It was in the sides of the north where all could see the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and they could easily see he's more glorious, more beautiful, even more than Lucifer. He's the high and lofty one in inhabiting eternity. So we need to worship him is what they should have been thinking. Now what's the failure in this scene? Well, you probably know this if you've read the Bible before or been a Christian very long at all. Lucifer exalts himself, drew a third part of the angels in a rebellion against the Most High. That's the failure. What's the result of that? What's the result of the failure in this scene is Lucifer and rebellious angels are cast out and dark waters are placed between God and his creation. And then what's the judgment? You got the creation of hell. Isaiah 14, 15, and Matthew 25, 41 shows you hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Isaiah 14, 15 shows you he's going to be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Okay, that's the introduction to this scene. And the main scriptures covered in this scene will be Genesis 1, 1 through 1, 2, Ezekiel 28, Jeremiah 4, Job 38, and Isaiah 14. Those are the main places we'll be looking at. And I'm going to explain to you in this scene what you have within the first two verses of your Bible in between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And in between those two verses... I believe is where you have Lucifer with a throne. God's give him some dominion. And you also have Lucifer's rebellion and many of the angels' rebellion during this time. So turn to Genesis 1-1. Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What you have in this verse is something amazing. It's the beginning of time. And before this, all you had was God in eternity. And when you go against God, you're dealing with the being that created time itself. So he's not limited to it. Are you limited to something you created? No. Since God created time, he isn't limited to it. Me and you are bound to time. We can't go backwards and we can't go forward. We're just, we're at the mercy of it. We are always in the present. And it's like the old Mario games and old video games where the screen is just constantly pushing you forward and you can't go back. The Lord, however, He can go backward, He can go forward, He can stop it, He can start it, He can completely control it. So no wonder God is so patient. He sees time a lot different than us. It says in 2 Peter 3, 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. You see, the Lord was here before the beginning, and he wanted to create for his pleasure, so he did. He created angels, he created seraphim, he created cherubim, he created all these angelic-type beings before he laid the foundation of the earth. So they were here in the beginning with him. They had a beginning, they were created by him, but they were here when God laid the foundations of the earth. In John 1, 1 through 5, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. That would include those angelic beings. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So we can call this scene this time period, in the beginning. That is exactly what it is. God's plan was to have a universe of sinless beings that loved Him and worshipped Him of their own free will. And at this time, those beings were the angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, and whatever other angelic-like beings that we may not even know about. And these were all created by the Lord Himself, just like we talked about in Colossians 1.16, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. 
You see, the Lord had to create the angelic beings before he created the earth because of what we see in Job 38. If you look at Job 38, verse 4, it says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. He's asking Job these questions. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? So that's the context. He's talking about when he laid the foundation. He said, Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? You see that he's talking about when he was making everything. He says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So you say, sons of God, well, that's just safe people. Right now, yeah, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you become a son of God. But that wasn't so then. And also, Adam and Eve were not present and watching God lay the foundations of the earth. These sons of God, these morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy when God was laying the foundation of the earth. That can't be people because it's before Adam and Eve. So the sons of God are these angelic-like beings. And they were there when God laid the foundations of the earth. The angels have free will. And at least up to this point, they were all choosing to worship God. Here they shouted for joy and praised him for what he was creating. And this would be the time when Satan, the devil, also known as Lucifer, was the anointed cherub that covereth. He's a created being. But God gave him a higher position than the others. He had an up-close and personal relationship to God. In Ezekiel 28, it talks about him. In Ezekiel 28, the Lord is going to address Lucifer, Satan, the devil, through the king of Tyrus, the wicked king who is possessed by the devil. And it says in Ezekiel 28, 12, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus. But he's talking to the spirit inhabiting Tyrus. And say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So the Lord is addressing the devil through the man he is using to run the world, just like he addressed him, just like he addressed the devil through Peter in Matthew sixteen twenty three, when he looked at Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. You see, he's he's looking at Peter, but he's talking to the devil. And since he says this guy is full of wisdom and perfect in beauty, we know it has to be referring to someone other than a mortal man because we're not full of wisdom like that. We're not perfect in beauty. Ezekiel 28, 13 says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pops was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. So the king of Tyrus was never in Eden. Further proof, he's talking to Lucifer right here. The spirit that possessed the king of Tyrus. And notice that he had pipes prepared in him in the day that he was created. This is why the apostate churches many times are so big on the pipe organs. And in Genesis 4.21, when you see Cain's line, you know, Cain's of that wicked one, right? They're the first musicians. And it says in Genesis 4.21 that they are the ones that handle the harp and organ. So you see these, these uh, apostate, religious, you know, creepy churches where they got these big pipe organs that play this creepy music. And it makes sense that the devil is very musically, musically gifted and it explains why the world's music has such a pull on people. Because... He had instruments built into him. But now back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel twenty-eight fourteen, Thou art the anointed cherub. That's Lucifer. He's not an angel. He's a cherub. And I believe there's a difference between cherubims and angels. As We'll get into that one day. But cherubims look completely different from angels. They seem to have a different job as well. And Lucifer was the main one. He was the one that was up top of God's throne, covering him. And it says, 
Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. The holy mountain of God is the, is the heavenly Mount Zion. In he Hebrews 12, 22, it says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. God has an innumerable company of angels. And Lucifer, a cherub, was the anointed cherub, most likely representing the reptilian class of cherubs, because that's the only one that's missing now. When you read about the cherubim, Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, you got the face of an ox, the face of an eagle, and you got all these faces, but you don't have something that represents the reptilian class, the aquatic class. That's what Lucifer represents. And Lucifer was placed at the top of this mountain, at the top of God's creation. He was second in command in God's creation, only under God, of course. And in Ezekiel 1, 25 through 26, where it's talking about the cherubim, you need to mark this down. Ezekiel 1 gives you a great description of the cherubim, and it and they seem to carry God's throne. That's that's and the throne is sitting on on top of the of this firmament that's above their heads. And Lucifer was a cherub who would have been on top of this firmament, covering God on his throne. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. He was above those other cherubim. Possibly this could have been a part of what led him to getting so lifted up in pride. As you know, Lucifer, the anointed cherub, and many of the angels didn't go along with the Lord's plan that he had for the universe, all of his creation. The Lord's plan was to have a universe full of sinless beings that would worship Him. And this scene in Scripture ends in failure. But it isn't the Lord's fault. It's never the Lord's fault. And the Lord always saw it coming. It's just that He gives His beings a free will and He will use their choice. But just like when you sin and choose something other than God, it's your fault. It's not God's fault. His will is that you get saved and live for Him. And the Lord's creation rarely goes along with the Lord's plan. An unknown amount of time, as I said, passes between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And during this time is when you have the rebellion of Lucifer and his angels. During that time is when they make the choice to not be a part of God's government. They want to overthrow God's government and establish their own. So Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's the perfect creation. God spoke the word into, world into existence. Everything that was around at that point, he spoke it into existence. There was no evolution going on. God was not using evolution. We're not theistic evolutionists. We don't believe that God made everything but used evolution to do it. No, we believe in spoken word creation. He spoke it. It was there. So all the people... Saying that, you get all these books that are teach against what I'm telling you. They say that we're putting billions of years at this point and making it accommodate science. That's not what we're doing. But it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Look at that verse. You see, there's after that first verse is where you put that gap. Where Lucifer is going to have a throne, but it's going to end in rebellion. And then a catastrophe is going to take place, as I'm going to show you later. And it's going to leave the earth without form and void and darkness is what you're going to have. That doesn't sound like a constructive act. It doesn't sound like God's constructing something here. It sounds like a destructive act has just been caused by the Lord himself. And he's left it without form and void and with darkness. Many times people, like I say, are going to slander you and make you to be a, a grand master villain if you teach that there is an unknown amount of time between those two verses. They make it seem as if you're teaching theistic evolution, that God used evolution and things evolved during that time. Or they try and make you think that we believe there are billions of years in between those two verses. And they say, that, you know, we're just trying to make the Bible more in line with science falsely so-called. And to line up with how these scientists think 
how old they think the earth is and whatnot. However, most Bible believers only believe that there are about 2,000 years or so between those two verses. But see, people hate the gap, so they begin to spread the false accus accusations, label you a false teacher, even go as far as calling you a heretic and say you're teaching heresy. Uh, that's crazy. Uh, therefore, they, but they put, instead of putting a gap in between the first two verses of the Bible, they put a gap in the body of Christ by causing divisions among believers. They not only spread false accusations, but they put a gap in the body of Christ, or they try to. They can't rightly divide Scripture, so they would rather right, they would rather divide the saints. They do two things the Scripture says you shouldn't do. One of them is falsely accuse. The other is so discord because they're very contentious about this many times. Not all of them. And I don't believe these people are bad people. I believe they're saved. And I believe that they're Bible believers most times. A lot of them are not. A lot of them change the Bible, correct the Bible. But... For the most part, you're not. There's not bad people on either side. You got to take it easy on people. Don't get so puffed up in your knowledge that you can't even have a conversation with somebody about the doctrines of the Bible because it's fun. It's fun talking about the Bible. That's what I'm trying to get through people's heads. The Bible's fun. The Bible's interesting. But they spread these false accusations, claiming that we got this doctrine from a guy named Thomas Chalmers. Any time that you hear somebody going against the gap, they talk about Thomas Chalmers, and they say he's the first one that came up with the gap. And it seems he did use the gap in between Genesis 1 and 1 and 1 2 to account for billions of years and to accommodate science falsely so-called. But there were way more people, years and years and years, all through church history, that taught the gap, and I'm going to even show you that Paul, the apostle himself, was a gapper later on, way before Thomas Chalmers came along. But we're not trying to accommodate for a science falsely so-called. That's not what we're doing at all. I still believe that the earth is young, and I still believe that man has only been here for about 6,000 years. It's just the earth that's older. I don't believe there were humans on the planet before Adam and Eve. Some gappers do believe that. I don't. I believe that it was the sons of God, the angelic beings that was here before Adam and Eve. I don't believe God used evolution. And I'm certainly not bothered by the fact that the Bible doesn't line up with Bible-rejecting, unsaved, God-hating scientists. Never are gappers, hardly ever, at least, at least the Bible-believing ones, they're never trying to accommodate science in these scientists. But here's what I do believe was going on between those first two verses. And here I want to show you a scene within a scene. I want to show you the day of evil. In Proverbs 16, 4, The Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. I want to go into more detail on Lucifer and his fall. Chronologically, the devil shows up for the first time as the old serpent in Genesis 3. That's the first time he shows up. It doesn't say nothing about him in between the first two verses of the Bible. you got to read the rest of the Bible to, to find out what happened. Obviously, in chapter 3 of Genesis, he's already in a fallen state. You see that? He's already the serpent. He's already evil. He's already, he's already up to no good. So this proves his fall happened before the fall of man. He didn't... You know, a lot of people say, well, he sinned right there when Adam and Eve sinned. No, he was he was a sinner before that. You see, you don't just up and decide, I'm going to commit this sin. It starts in your mind. It's a process in your mind. You start thinking evil, you eventually do it. When Lucifer fell, it, it was the day of evil. And we know what happened after the in the beginning of Genesis 1-1 because the Lord himself said Lucifer was a murderer from the beginning. And we know what happened before Adam sinned because the devil was already the serpent before he tempted Eve. And there was already a tree of knowledge of good and evil as well. The day of evil had already happened. Satan had already fell. And he's not just the serpent because he represents the reptilian class of cherubs. Because if you... Look at that word serpent throughout the Bible. It's negative and it represents sin. And let's get this clear about the fall of Lucifer and just start from the beginning. 
Because this is a big thing. This is a big part of the Bible. So Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is where you have a sinless creation. You have God setting up his government. You have him giving dominion to Lucifer. Probably other principalities and powers as well. And you have a planet that is inhabited by the angels. And Lucifer is given a throne during this time. But as you know, Lucifer rebelled. And God cast him down. God created Lucifer for the purpose of receiving praise from him, receiving honor and glory and worship from him. And the Lord's throne would have been seen by his creation. I mean, they were operating by sight. They could see it. That was the like the sign or token of this time. You know, I mean, they could look up and see it. Nothing was separating him from them. The high and lofty one inhabiting eternity <clears throat> being visible on the throne was a good enough sign that showed his creation what they should be doing. And that is worshiping him as the most high. That was their, <clears throat> that was what they had to do. That was the agreement. Lucifer in his free will chose another route. He had free will. You know, and God would have used his choice if Lucifer never sinned. He would have used that choice as well. And who knows what would have happened. But God will use your choices. He wants you to make the right choice. But whatever choice you choose, he will get the glory out of it. So the Lord sees Lucifer's rebellion. And he will use his choice for his glory. He will use Lucifer to be the alternative choice for all of his creation. He, he created the angels with a free will. But up until now, they didn't have an alternate choice other than God. They just had God. They didn't have an evil thing to choose. Other than to go against him and exalt themselves above him. They didn't have somebody to look at and say, hey, I'm going to choose this guy. The, f the first covenant he had with the angels was simply just that they were to praise him, honor him, and worship him. After, after Lucifer broke that covenant, there's another choice. Now the choice is choose God or choose Lucifer. And some of the angels chose the devil. They went with him. And Matthew 25, 41 talks about the devil and his angels. And it talks about hell being prepared for the devil and his angels. I believe that's where hell shows up. I believe hell was here before Adam and Eve because it was prepared for the devil and his angels. I don't believe it was original. The original plan was for man to go there because at that time man hadn't seen yet. God gives angels the free will to choose just like he does me and you. Nobody makes the choice for you to get saved. It's your choice. And the Lord isn't willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he's not going to force you to choose him. He doesn't want robots who are forced to love him, right? Remember, Lucifer was the anointed cherub, and he had a throne. God gave him some dominion, just like he does Adam in Genesis chapter 1. The throne, beauty, and wisdom that the devil corrupted and lost is something he's bitter about to this very day. Why do you think he hated Adam so much? <clears throat> Why do you think he hates you so much? In Ezekiel 28, 11 through 13, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation to the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. That was Lucifer. He said, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Lucifer had been in Eden, the garden of God. So his throne at that time was on the earth. And the earth was at this time since there was no sin, it was at the top of the universe. Nothing was was in between God and his creation. Lucifer was literally on top of the world and the universe. And second in command only to God himself. Imagine falling from such a high position and the Lord giving dominion to someone who is made a little lower than the angels. Imagine how envious, bitter you would become. You see, Lucifer, he was high up there. That's what made that sin so disgusting and vile. Because he knew God so up close and personal that there was no misunderstanding about what the 
agreement is here. There was no misunderstanding about what was required of him. He was up there in the sides of the north, as the Bible calls it, at the top of the mountain of his of the Lord's holiness. And Psalm 48, 1 through 2 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, <clears throat> the city of the great king. You see, there's a, a physical Mount Zion on earth and there's a heavenly Mount Zion that's also physical but it's spiritual too. And God was in that heavenly Mount Zion on the sides of the north. That's the city of the great king. Lucifer was up there too before he fell. The city of God is in Mount Zion, the heavenly Mount Zion. It's on the sides of the north. Now, that's significant. I'm going to show you how to study the Bible. You search that phrase, the sides of the north. Look where it takes you. That's exactly where you're going to see Lucifer wanted to exalt himself above. Search that phrase, the sides of the north. It'll take you to Isaiah 14. So go to Isaiah 14, look at verse 13. It says, and this is talking to the devil. The Lord's talking to the devil here. It says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. The devil had a throne above the stars of God. I will sit also up on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Before Lucifer's fall, remember, Nothing was separating God from his creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven, singular. So it seems before Lucifer's fall that the Lord had the universe, but it just didn't have stars, sun, or the moon. He just had just one big infinite expanse of space full of light. And the earth was at the top of that. And there was no top to what we now call the second heaven. And that is why it's simply called the sides of the north. In Isaiah 14 and Psalm 48, you see it called the sides of the north, the city of the great king. However, after Lucifer's fall, you're going to see that something will be separating God from his creation, and that will be the face of the deep. But more on that later. In Ezekiel 28, 14, it says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. <clears throat> Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You see, Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covereth. God said the phrase, I have set thee so. That shows it was God that gave him such a high position. Uh, he said, I have set thee so. He's saying, you know, you didn't get there on your own. It wasn't because you were great. It's because I made you this powerful. I made you in this position. I put you there. That in itself should have humbled Lucifer under the almighty hand of God. Yet he was lifted up in pride and wanted to overthrow the Lord's government. He wanted to overthrow the Lord's throne. Remember that whatever high position you may have, the Lord allowed you to have it. Whatever talent, natural ability, gift, or some circumstance, blessing, or trait, in your life or characteristic you have, the Lord is the one who allows you to have it. Never get lifted up in pride and think you're superior to God or anyone else. If you do, then you're just acting like Lucifer. Ezekiel 28, 15, Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. Lucifer was created perfect. Even though the Lord knew he would sin, the Lord made him without iniquity. He had a choice. Lucifer had a free will to choose to serve and worship God. Just because Lucifer was created on a day, as it says, you know, in the day that thou was created, that doesn't mean it was one of the refashioning days of the earth in Genesis 1. You see, God uses those days to show a progression, you know, in the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning were the second day, and so on and so forth. He's using those, using those days to show a progression, showing those consecutive days to show the refashioning of the earth. But that doesn't mean there weren't days before that day or before those days. For example, when you say, I start the first day of my job tomorrow, that doesn't mean you hadn't worked previous days somewhere else, right? 
The days in Genesis chapter 1 show his progression and timeline with the refashioning of the earth. That doesn't mean that there weren't days before that. But the fact that there was a day when iniquity was found in Lucifer, and there wasn't iniquity with him from the start, that also shows that this isn't just referring to the human king of Tyrus in Ezekiel 28. Because every man is born a sinner. It's like it says in Psalm 51, 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. It says in Psalm 58, 3, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. So God created Lucifer without iniquity. He became the devil. He didn't make Lucifer sin. He used Lucifer's sin and choice to further his own plans. Whatever choice you make, God's going to use it for his plan. God will use your choice. And if you choose to get saved and live right and serve him, then he will use that choice. If you choose to reject God and go against God, he'll use that choice and get glory out of either one. Just like he did with Lucifer, just like he does with Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. In Ezekiel 28, 16, it says, By the multitude of thy merchandise... Notice that merchandise. What do the what do the false preachers who are led by the devil do? With feigned words they make merchandise of you. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. There's that mountain again. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub. The king of Tyrus is not a covering cherub. That shows you he's talking to the spirit inhabiting this king. I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Notice he said, by the multitude of thy merchandise. Lucifer has always been a salesman. He gives a sales pitch to Eve in the garden. He gave a sales pitch to the angels that rebelled. He gives his sales pitch to you. He comes to you and says, do this sin, and you'll get this or that. He gave his sales pitch to the Lord and uh, Matthew chapter 4, he said in Matthew 4, 9, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. So he made merchandise of the angels that sinned. He, he, he was using them. He, he, he tricked them. He gave them his sales pitch. You know, rebel against God, you can be a part of my kingdom. Help me overthrow the Lord's kingdom. You can be a part of my kingdom. So the Lord cast Lucifer out because of his pride. Ezekiel twenty-eight seventeen it says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom. He corrupted his wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. You see, Lucifer was full of wisdom, but he corrupted his wisdom. Now his wisdom is evil and satanic. And I don't believe this is just referring to Lucifer. I believe this is also looking forward. Because God can look forward. This is referring to the Antichrist as well. Whose heart's going to be lifted up. Who's going to be wise but have corrupted wisdom. And he's going to lay him before kings. But Lucifer was full of wisdom. He corrupted his wisdom. Now he's got evil wisdom. Satanic wisdom. James 3.14 says, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. You see, he was blinded by his own beauty and brightness. It seems that he was so beautiful that his own beauty deceived himself. It's just like a lot of people. Some people have a lot of money. they got a lot of smarts, looks, charm, athletic ability, musical talent. And they deceive themselves by their own good traits. And Galatians 6.3 says, For if a man think himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. Lucifer had all this going for him. But standing next to God, he's nothing. In Ezekiel 28, 18, it says, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth the fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Notice that defiled thy sanctuaries. He brought corruption to a location, the original earth, 
and the universe was affected. Just as Adam would bring sin to the human race, Lucifer brought sin to the universe. Adam brought sin to the world, to the, to the humans. Lucifer brought to the universe. You think you're only hurting yourself, right, when you sin? No, your sin hurts everything around it. Hurts everybody around it. It says, he said, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Once again, he's a salesman. Most likely, he offered the angels a deal. Something in exchange for joining up against the Lord. What do you see today? You hear about drug trafficking, sex trafficking. What do big cities have? Too much traffic. Uh, what do the wicked websites have? Tons of traffic coming in. You see, the devil knows how to get the crowds. You see all the mega churches with false doctrine, and you look out at that church into the crowd, you see, you look into the parking lot, you're going to see it's full of traffic. Somehow the devil was slick enough to deceive many of the innumerable company of angels, and he got a crowd, maybe with his musical seduction, maybe with his good words and fair speeches. But I believe what you have in Ezekiel 28 is also prophecy about the Antichrist, the man who will be Satan incarnate. You know, that which hath been is that which shall be. And it says in Ezekiel 28, 19, All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. You see, that's a prophecy of the Antichrist, Satan incarnate, the one who's going to be on top of the world, the king of the tribulation. You're going to have the Antichrist kingdom. But he's going to be brought down to hell, and the one who was on top of the world, Lucifer, way back when, will be brought down to hell. We can also find a lot of information about this by looking at Isaiah 14 in detail. Isaiah 14, 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? And during the time between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, there were nations. There were kings. There were spirit beings. Lucifer being the top dog under God. And you think that's far-fetched? Well, there's spiritual principalities and powers even right now. For example, in Ephesians 6, 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So it's not a physical thing we're wrestling against, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And consider also Michael the archangel has angels under him in Revelation 12. So God made these beings with leaders and an order to them. But Lucifer was the top dog. That was until he began to say some things in his heart. Isaiah 14, 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also up on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Things start out in your heart before they make it out of your mouth and before you commit the act. Matthew five twenty eight. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed all adultery already in his heart. Matthew twelve thirty four. O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart... The mouth speaketh. It starts in the heart. Lucifer said some things in his heart. Watch out for who you are placing on the throne of your heart. Is it you? Is it an idol? Is it a false god? Or do you have the Lord on the throne of your heart? Lucifer had placed himself on the throne of his heart before he ever tried to break in and take the Lord's throne. Isaiah 14, 14 through 15 says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. If I had to guess, then I'd say this is when hell was created. Matthew twenty five forty one. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, and to everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was originally created for the devil and his angels. Yet men go there. It was created for the devil and his angels because of Lucifer's sin and the angels' rebellion with him. It wasn't created for man because at that time when it was created, Adam hadn't even been created or caused sin to come into the world yet. <clears throat> now Genesis 1.1, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In addition to Lucifer being cast out 
in the creation of hell, the Lord also flooded out the original creation at this time and left it without forming void. If such a catastrophe as Adam eating off of a tree caused sin to come into the world, nature and animal life being affected as well, then imagine what kind of catastrophe such as a spirit being such as Lucifer attempting to overtake God's throne. Imagine what that would have caused. Adam brought sin into the world. See Romans 5.12. But Lucifer brought sin into the universe. Remember, there was already a tree of knowledge of good and evil before Adam fell. In Genesis 1-2, it says, And the earth was without form. This is after the catastrophe had taken place. After God had wiped everything out with the universal flood, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And such a teaching that there's a gap here seems far-fetched to most people because this teaching has been thrown out for a while now. So let's really look into this thing. Let's look... We covered mostly just in this about Lucifer's fall and things. But let's really dig deep into this. Get it settled. Are we going to believe in the gap or are we not going to believe in the gap? If you choose not to, okay, that's fine too. We're still friends. You're still a Bible believer if you're not changing the Word of God. But let's really figure it out. Let's not just say, uh, well, no, it's too far-fetched or let's not just say, yeah, it definitely is because my favorite teacher is a gapper and I'm going to believe in the gap because he does. Let's really figure it out for ourselves. Let's really examine the evidence. <clears throat> and the next time I really, I'm wanting to look at Genesis 1-2 and talk about these phrases, without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. So, this has been a Bible Scene Selection the Bible Institute, and we've looked at the gap, we've looked at the fall of Lucifer, so next time we'll get more into these words and phrases in Genesis 1-2, and I'm going to show you how they're negative throughout the entire Bible. <clears throat>